yeah uh i hope everybody had a lunch here uh so i'm going to update a little bit on myopia what's happening in myopia in children so if you look at the talk i would be talking a little bit on work up on these patient a change in the instrumentation what has happened in last few years the change in interventions the gaps in knowledge and what is the translational research so at one time we were able to probably when you worked up we we you worked up these patients we only used to ask cursory history but now i think it is history is important because your interventions will depend on whether the one parent is myopic both parents are myopic premature child was born premature or full term so i that builds your risk profile because if both parents are myopic child is six times more likely to develop myopia progressive myopia rather than if only one parent is myopic so history is important in the workup previously the workup consisted of mostly only cycloplegic refraction and maybe a post mediatric test but now we need to document a little bit more on myopia children, children with myopia you probably have to pay attention to axial length keratometry as well as central corneal thickness uh we need to do a peripheral refraction using a open field refractometer if possible or otherwise manually also it is possible to do it we also look at binocular vision which includes cover test and lag of accommodation mostly because lag of accommodation is important for again from the intervention point of view some people even suggest doing a uh, basic dry eye workup also so what has changed among the in so what what is changed in our instrumentation so at one point it was enough to do cycloplegic refraction alone but with the newer interventions it is important to select the correct intervention and you need peripheral refraction which is using an open field refractometer is an integral part of the workup choroidal thickness is also a dynamic factor and it is affected by number at this point there isn't enough data on how you will choose myopia intervention based on uh, oct or uh, choroidal thickness but this is something it's uh, probably in it's it's a, it's a work in line uh, it's a work in pipeline and probably there will be more data and knowledge available in a uh, few years so thickness can either be measured with oct or with a b scan white field imaging especially useful in younger children and indispensable if you are looking at a syndromic or very high myopia and electrodiagnostics of course wherever indicated so electrodiagnostics are indicated if vision is not improving despite wearing glasses if one or another close members of the family have a syndromic uh, loss of vision if there is a history of consanguinity in that case myopia or if there is a presence of nystagmus in all these situations probably electrodiagnostics become indispensable so what has what has what is the update on interventions so previously uh, our interventions were only limited to glasses or contact lenses but now you need a little bit of chair time to basically in these three groups our interventions fall on lifestyle modifications pharmacolo pharmacological and optical interventions so what are the lifestyle modifications outdoor activities sunlight exposure both are known to be protective against myopia or rather myopia progression uh, there are enough data and several studies which have shown that progression decreases if the child spends at least 2 hours outdoors and both uh, screen time against and excessive near work screen time have again been linked are considered myopia genic and definitely increase progression so that also probably you need to spend some time educating parents about handheld gadgets about limiting the use of handheld gadgets especially in younger children often we have seen ki the the child is fed while give, showing the mobile and that that is probably not a great idea in future uh, good quality sleep at least 8 hours of good quality sleep is also considered as a you should probably insist on these so this is a, this is something which you every patient with myopia along with first prescription of glasses you don't have to give a low dose atropine but this is something you need to talk to the parents and all of these points now pharmacological intervention basically low dose atropine again and in india it's only available in 0.01% but you need in uh, other countries it is available in 
0.02, 0.05, and several other uh, compounded products are also available. But in India, commercially available is only 0.01%, and it still is very, very effective, up to 60% reduction in myopia uh, progression. Oral 7-methylxanthine is available only in some countries in Europe and has not been proved as effective as atropine, but to completion's sake, this has been tried. Now, coming to optical intervention, there has been an explosion in the number of specialty optical devices. The most important of them are which produce a def optical defocus, peripheral def myopic defocus, which are in two uh, uh, DIMMs, which is a def defocus incorporated in multiple segments, and another technology is highly aspherical lenslets, which have been, uh, one is by Hoya Vision and another is by Silor, and there is another Myovision, which also produces this optical defocus, which is, uh, which is, which is marketed by Zeiss. You have dual focus contact lenses, which are also only FDA approved contact lenses, which are available for myopia control. And that can be in a toric version also available. Then there is dot lens, which does not really produce a defocus, but it reduces, it has these translucent dots incorporated in glasses, which reduce uh, contrast at the level of retina. And that is supposed to be a protective feature against myopia. Now coming to orthokeratology, again, this is the only intervention along with low dose atropine, which is really seems to be having good results um, with as far as the myopia control is con concerned. Orthokeratology involves a specially designed contact lens, wearing it overnight to flatten the anterior part of the cornea or central part of the cornea and producing a peripheral steepening, which is supposed to uh, produce a defocus and works in the same way like other optical intervention. So most of these optical interventions reported efficacy is between 50 to 60 percent. They are most effective if children who have relative peripheral hyperopia. That's why I said peripheral refraction is important because it may not be these may not be very effective in children who don't have this peripheral hyperopia. Uh, we have six year data available for and some data on rebound available for these optical interventions. So far, no major rebound has been noted. But 10 percent, but always you have to remember whatever the inter intervention, 10 to 15 percent children are likely to be non-responders. And also downside in our situation is these all these optical interventions are fairly expensive compared to anything else available compared to say low dose atropine. Light therapy, this is an experimental uh, therapy and and repeated low light red light has low level red light has been used. Uh, to uh, to kind of to uh, produce myopia control and axial length elongation over a period was 0.13 compared to 0.38 in children who wore a single vision glasses. So it is probably a promising alternative therapy, but more data needs to be available. What are our gaps in knowledge at this point? We don't know what is the mechanism of action of low dose atropine and if there is any extremely long-term effects which are associated with. We do assume that it is, it stimulates the dopamine, it, uh, which is a, uh, but how exactly which receptors are inhibited, there is a little bit of gap in knowledge on that. Again, atropine does not affect axial and elongation as much as it does. Effect is mostly on the cycloplegic refraction. So the protective effect of uh, myopia control in terms of, in terms of uh, controlling the elongation, i.e. elongation, which leads to retinal changes and pathological mind. Is it really going to be protective? We have, we have to wait for some years before we can answer that question. Again, there is a little bit of a uh, question on what is the best strategy for children who don't respond. There is several alternative uh, uh, strategies mentioned, but there isn't enough evidence to support that this works better than the other. So what lies ahead as translational research, scleral, scleral cross-linkage using both uh, uh, riboflavin with some uh, red light. And we probably need to do some work on identifying children who are pre-myops, sorry, that's a spelling mistake there. And whether we need to intervene in high-risk children who are siblings of children who are myopic or who are born to both parents who are myopic, should we start intervention before they become myopic? These are the unanswered questions at this point. Thank you for the attention.
Thank you very much, Sumita, for covering all the myopia updates so comprehensively and also the gaps in the knowledge that we can further look at uh, for which we can get some answers.